One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming. Glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering, anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. Hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree, and He took the nails for me. Living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified, Freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer, one day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered, now is ascended, my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day one day the trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing. My Savior Jesus is mine. He's mine. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. going to come and get us again someday. We're pressing toward that mark. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 6. Genesis, chapter 6. This will be the third part in a series, As in the Days of Noah. I do not know that I'll do uh, our subject justice tonight because I'm gonna, I want to try to zip through it. It's been a, just such a long week for everybody, and I don't know how this is going to work out, but maybe we'll get out pretty quick. Let's stand together, please, reading God's Word. I will say this, our talk to our granddaughter today and our grandson, ask him what they learned in Sunday school. And Braxton, he's five. He said, uh, Paul, Paul, we learned about the burning bush. And 
I said, who was there? He said, God spoke out of the burning bush, and, and it didn't burn up. And I said, who else was there? He said, Moses was there, and he just gave a pretty clear description of, of that. Baylor, she's three. She had kind of run around there listening to all that. I said, Bay, Bay, what'd you learn? She said, uh, she said, I learned about the angels running after the people. I thought, well, I don't know quite where that's at in the Bible. I'm sure it's there. But I said, so the angels, oh, yes. I said, told Nana, said the angels are running after the people. <laughs> so I hope the angels aren't running after you tonight. Um, my wife asked her later, said, Bay, Bay, did, they, did them angels ever catch those people? Nope, Nana never did catch them. Never did catch them. So. <laughs> Only thing I can tell you is tomorrow morning when you get up and run like mad. <laughs> but uh, demonic forces were very alive and well in Noah's day. We touched on that somewhat the other night. But I want to just take one verse this evening. And we're going to be all over the Bible. So I want you to keep your Bibles close if you would. And um, I'm really going to talk about an, an, an atmosphere or a spirit in those days that that I don't ever want to affect you. Now, I realize to a certain extent, on Sunday night I'm preaching to the choir. What I mean by that is a large majority of you have worked hard this week. And um, I'm going to talk about that in just a while. But I want to talk about a, a subject that, that I, I don't want you to miss that many people are missing today. Look at verse number 3 of Genesis chapter 6. Right before the flood and uh, right before his, his talking with Noah, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. Would you read that with me, our text verse tonight? Let's read that together out loud. Ready? And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, Yet his days shall be in 120 years. I'm going to speak on this subject for just a while tonight. The striving of the Spirit of God. The striving of the Spirit of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. And I want to do it justice. This will not necessarily be an expositional message. We'll take our topic tonight and chase it throughout the scriptures. But I pray before we leave this evening that we would be enlightened you might say or have our eyes open to the underworld and to what is going on even before our very eyes in our culture today in America that's pulling Christians away from you teach us from thy word we pray please tonight in Jesus name I ask amen thank you, you may be seated we have a very serious subject before us tonight and I don't don't want to make light of it at all in fact I want to say from the very beginning you ought to be thankful that God is working in your heart. Amen. How many say, I'm grateful that God regularly convicts me. Amen. He strives with me. He shows me where I'm wrong. And I hope that you sense that in your life daily. Several times a day you say, well, man, that preacher, I wouldn't be a very good Christian if that was getting. No, no, that's a good thing. It's a good thing for the Holy Spirit of God to strive with you, to get you going the right direction. Well, there came a day in Noah's generation that God had stopped doing that. And he uh, announced the prophecy of that when he says, Here my spirit shall not always strive with man. That does not necessarily mean that God was going to take away his Holy Spirit from man, although we understand the function of the Holy Spirit of God was a little different in the Old Testament than it was in the New Testament. But it did mean that there would come a time when the Holy Spirit would stop laboring on man's heart to get him to obey God. This uh, subject is addressed in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, regarding the flood in Noah. It says this, and I quote, When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now understand there was a time that God did strive with man. There was a time that Noah was the only one that listened in his family. But the Bible says that God had long suffering and he patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. In other words, God gave mankind that 120 years, 
120-year window to make things right with God. Now, we'll talk about that some tonight. Sadly, we understand only eight souls have their hearts right with God. Isaiah described it like this in Isaiah 57, verse 15. God says, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, neither will I always be wroth. For the spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made. And what he's saying there as he's speaking to the prophet Isaiah he said, uh, I'm not going to be angry all the time. I'm going to put this thing to rest. We understood in the days of Noah that he was grieved. He was upset and how much mankind and how much grace mankind had walked away from. We preached on that already. One of the signs that God showed mankind of his patience with him is that of the, or his lack of patience, is that his patience was running out is that of the shortening of his lifespan mentioned in verse number 3. Once you look at it again, he says two things about this. He says, uh, for he also is flesh. I'll mention that in a moment. Wow. He said, then yet his days shall be 120 years. Understand that as we read Scripture, chapter 5 of Genesis, what I call Tombstone Alley, you might say, and all the patriarchs were beginning to die after Adam. Started with Adam's death all the way down to Lamech's, Lamech's death. We learned that Adam lived to be 930 years old. Methuselah, 969 years old. We'll address his name in just a moment. Noah was 950 years old when he died. So we're saying, folks, tonight that's nearly 1,000 years of grace, 1,000 years that mankind used to have in the first couple of millennia to get their hearts right with God. How many say, I wish I had 1,000 years to get my heart right with God? Well, this age of grace, we should do better than that. And so God says now the lifespan of man was going to fall sharply after the flood. For instance, Moses died at 120 years, and King David died at age 70. In fact, he writes about that in Psalm 90 and verse 9, For all of our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore and ten, that's 70, if by reason of strength they be fourscore, that's 80. Yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. The point is that every year that you live is a reminder that God stri is striving with you to make your heart right with Him. We sing that song, He's Still Working on Me. Again, let me ask you, I'm glad that God is working on you. I hope God convicts you every day. I hope He convicts you several times a day. I hope God is laboring with you to get you to do right, to get you to serve God, to get you to be faithful. That's the moving of the Spirit of God in your life. But someday that will be over just like Noah's day as we get closer to the judgment day. And so the years have been shortened since Noah's day. Now, we've already discussed in previous messages that the wicked sin that grieved the heart of God and brought on death and destruction and this worldwide flood, but in keeping with our theme, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. But we ask this question tonight, what is it that should concern us in this generation? I want us to consider that. Our point is made here in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. Man had sinned against God, and man continues to sin against God. So what is it that should concern us in this generation here's the answer don't miss this our relationship to the truth of God's Word what is your relationship what is your attitude what is your feeling toward the truth of the Word of God Noah was the last man standing that listened to and believed the truth of God man had sinned against God God was going to destroy man for his sin Man needed to repent and get in the ark to avoid destruction. Eight souls were saved. Out of millions that had multiplied on the face of the earth in Noah's day, no one else believed. Can you see a little bit of that spirit right now in our society? As the stadiums fill and God's church empties out. This matter of our relationship with the truth 
of God. It's no different today. Man is sin today. God's going to destroy man in this world for his sin. By the way, can I just stop and say this? How many of you still believe Jesus is coming again? And how many believe that after the rapture there's going to be seven years of great tribulation? And how many believe that God says, I'm going to destroy this earth and make it new again? How many of y'all still believe that? That's in the Bible. Your relationship to that particular thought and event that's coming someday. I think about Noah. God said he's going to destroy the world with a flood. He builds an ark. For 120 years, Noah had never seen anything like this, yet he worked every day anticipating that God would be truthful with what he said. You and I have never seen God destroy the whole earth. We have never seen the mighty terror of Almighty wrath of Almighty God like it's going to be in during those days. But ladies and gentlemen, that does, negate, does not negate the fact that it's going to happen and you and I are moving toward that day. We should be purifying ourselves in regard to that. And so Jesus is the ark of safety for us. Once you take your Bibles, please, and turn to Isaiah chapter 59, if you would. Isaiah chapter 59. Our relationship, and we'll talk about that for just a moment in a way of introduction. I'll give you a few points here in just a moment. But our relationship, what is your attitude toward the truth of the Word of God, God's Word? What is your attitude toward alcohol? What is your atti attitude toward sodomy? What is your attitude toward abortion? What is your attitude toward uh, the Ten Commandments? What is your attitude toward anything that thus saith the Word of God? Your church attendance, your tithing, your soul winning, evangelism, you're trying to live a good, moral, clean life. What's your attitude toward those things? You understand that in our generation, folks are walking away from truth. Christians, so-called Christians, are walking away from the truth. And Satan is using those, those folks to make the rest of us that still believe truth look like bozos. And so uh, Isaiah got into this. He was pleading for his country. We pick up reading verse number 12 of Isaiah 59. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. What does that mean? This is unbelievable. In, in Isaiah's day, the people of God were saying, we know what our sins are. Uh, they testify. They're in front of us. We know exactly what our sins are. But yet they would not ask God for forgiveness. Verse 12, in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, uh, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Uh, verse 14, and judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off for truth is fallen in the street and inequity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth. He that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey and the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness had sustained him for he put on uh, righteousness as a breastplate. And so the Bible is declaring here that there is a sort of conspiracy, you might say, uh, toward the truth. And we'll see that in just a moment in Ezekiel. My point is the prophet Isaiah is declaring that truth uh, is fallen in the street. In other words, this matter of truth failing will become a public matter. Let me say that again. This, this thought of truth failing, falling in the street, would be a public matter. You and I are witnessing that today. I, I just, uh, I, I thought the world today is caught up in this conspiracy of a lie, just like Eve our first representative believed a lie, plunging the human race into sin. It's happened again. Uh, just in our nations, full of false gods. People worship false gods right now in our nation. I don't remember that as a little boy growing up. I know it kind of went on, but I don't remember it. False prophets, a false sense of security, uh, fake news. Just getting people that's supposed to tell the truth to tell us the truth. Amen. I want to give you three things tonight. I want you to write these down. We're going to do a little Bible study this evening. But I want you to write down three things that we need to be reminded of as we go into these last days regarding the truth. 
You got to know the truth. It's the truth that sets us free. It's the truth that gets us to make right decisions. And your relationship to the truth in these last days means everything. And you got to ask yourself, who is influencing you with what they call truth? I hope you're not going to the world for that because the world doesn't have the truth. The world rejects the truth of the Word of God. I want you to write these three things down. Number one, the prince of this world is a liar. Would you write that down? The prince of this world is a liar. Jesus said this in John 8, 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Speaking of Satan. Currently, whether you realize it or not, we are being conditioned to believe a lie so that we will believe the ultimate lie, that is this, that Jesus is not God, that Satan is God. That is what First John called the spirit of Antichrist. And by the way, I'm not going to touch on this tonight, but the false Bibles in, in the English language especially, many of those are New Age Bibles that pull you away from who Jesus Christ really is, the deity of Christ. Jesus is God, don't ever forget that. And Jesus is to be our Lord. We're being manipulated through the media. You can't get honest news anymore. Just last week, I decided, I don't know where I'm going to get my news at. The last two holdouts that I used to get my news have, for whatever reason, sold out. I don't know if they're losing advertisers. I don't know if they're threatening the people at the top. I don't know what, they, what they've done. One news site in particular said that they sold out. I'm not sure. But I'm going to say this right now. It is hard to get truthful news. Now, I want to make another statement while I'm at it. Some of you young people never watch the news. I didn't watch the news when I was a kid either. And, and I understand that. you got better things to do. and just It's just, I, I can't even tell you where to go to get good news. Some of you that are older at college age right now, you don't pay a whole lot of attention to the news. And that's okay, and I understand that. But to a certain extent, all of us need to be schooled in what's going on in our society or else you'll believe a lie. I like to be able to stand up here and tell you where to go get your news. I don't know, but I know one thing, that if you'll read the Word of God and you'll so indoctrinate yourself with the truth of this Bible, you will be able to discern a lie. Somebody said the way that you figure out what a counterfeit bill is, if you, they, they te teach bank tellers, I guess, I've never done this, but they teach them to handle the real thing. And whenever something that's not the real thing comes through their hands, they stop and they question it. Every now and then you'll see somebody hold up a $50 bill or a $100 bill because sometimes those are a little newer and immediately something did not feel right in their fingertips. Can I say that you ought to be such a Christian that you spend so much time in the Word of God every day that whenever you hear something on ABC, NBC, MSNBC, CNN, or now I'm even questioning some of the things that Fox News does now. When you hear a lie, you're able to ascertain what is truthful. And so I, I'm not telling you to base your life on the news because that makes you want to go jump off a bridge somewhere. I'm just saying that we're being manipulated through the media. It's hard to get honest news. By the way, we're being duped on the Internet. I'm going to go over my head here just a little bit so some of you IT people, uh, you can, you can uh, straighten me out after church, all right? Uh, Google is the leading search engine for uh, Internet searches, and they control uh, what is believed uh, to be truthful. Now they have different bias. They have political bias. They have educational bias. They have medical bias. They certainly have religious bias. But they also have, they also have advertising dollars bias, which, by the way, is driving a lot of your news sites today. Advertisers, that's how they make their money. <laughs> oh, may God help us. They... Uh, they have what is called an algorithm. How many ever heard of the word algorithm? Hold your hand. Okay, if you're on the computer, very much, very well. If you don't know what that is, may God bless you. Go eat a lot of Krispy Kreme donuts and enjoy life. An algorithm is a human-conceived set of rules to define the process in which data is received and dispensed upon request. That, in other words, you may not always be directed to the truth when you Google search a particular subject. You think you are, 
but Google and some of the other search engines, I'm just reading about Google right now, but uh, they'll direct you where they want to direct you. I found this out. I, I'm constantly searching things about rheumatoid arthritis and different uh, things that you can do for that. And, and I know there are certain, certain things that you can, you, you can do to help with all that. And so that's just one little maybe practical thing. But, but, uh, and I don't use Google to search much for Bible things because there's no telling where it's going to take you. But I'm just saying, uh, you'll be directed to the site based upon the choice of that program, pre-programmed algorithm. If you don't know what I'm talking about, see Matt Hayes, he can talk to you about this. But it's a real thing right now because when you go searching for the truth, you may or may not get it. But thank God, every time we go to the Word of God, we're always going to get the truth. That's all I can say about that. But the prince of the power of the air, or the, I like to say the prince of the power of the airwaves, he controls that realm. I preached years ago on this, the, the media. The media is the medium or the in, in between, supposed to be completely biased. You drive down an interstate highway and you have what is, what is called the, the median or the middle. And uh, uh, that's what the media is supposed to be. But they've left that a long time ago, probably in the age of Walter Cronkite. We didn't even realize it. Number two, not only is the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world a liar, number two, by the way, he's controlling his sex now, number two, the preachers of the last days will go soft. You need to know that. This one probably irritates me the most. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Timothy chapter number four. 2 Timothy chapter number four, I'm talking about how God strives with man. How God constantly is pouring in your ear of your soul His truth. Truth. The Spirit of God, the Word of God is coming at us with truth. Don't do this, do that. According, based upon the Word of God and the Spirit of God in us. That's the Spirit of God striving with you tonight. I trust as I'm preaching the Word of God that the Spirit of God is striving in your soul right now to do that which is right. We come to a time in the last days in 2 Peter chapter 4 and verse 2 Timothy chapter 4 that the preachers of the last days will go soft. The Bible says in verse number 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. And what's the next word? Doctrine. I preached this morning on, I, 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 I preached this morning, I use a lot of doctrine. Maybe I shouldn't have done that this morning. I don't know. I was kind of beat myself up about that, but I was so thankful and grateful for the decision that were made. I, I just want to say this. I always want to be a pastor of a church where people can sit back there and take line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and understand Bible doctrine. That's Bible teaching. Not for the purpose of being deep, but to be a doer of the Word, not just hearers only. So he said, I want you to preach the Word. I want you to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Here's why. Look at the next word. For. Here's why. Because of this. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, Shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears? They shall turn away their, truths, their ears from the, from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So in the last days, preachers would be ear-tickling preachers. They would stop <laughs> reproving. How many understand that reproving is a negative, has a negative connotation? Even more so is rebuking. That's when the preacher says, Thus saith the word of God. And so... Uh, Preachers are back away from that. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn back the Old Testament to Ezekiel chapter 22. Let me show you this. Ezekiel chapter 22. I, I'm going to run down this. We'll be real quick right here. But I'm trying to condition your soul to receive the truth of the Word of God and reject the lie that the world, the media, the flesh is teaching you and understand that it's the Word of God and the preached Word of God that gives us the truth. That's why I'm using a lot of the Bible. I don't want you to take my word for it. There was, a, there was a time when Ezekiel was prophesying during the darkest days of Judah's history. As he writes these lines in Ezekiel 22, we understand that they were in the middle of the 70-year captivity. Watch this now. Judah was gone. 
Israel was gone. They had been hauled away by the Assyrian captivity years before. In other words, the nation of Israel, as we know it, was gone. Why was that? Because they rejected the truth. You say it can't happen. Look at England right now. Look at Europe right now. We don't want to become like that. Look at this, please, if you would. In verse number 25, underscore this phrase. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. A conspiracy of lies. You'll see in this moment, like, like a roaring lion, ravening prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure of precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests, circle that, have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put a, no difference between the holy and the profane. Watch this now. There is a difference between the holy and the world. You don't separate the secular from the sacred. Everything is holy, but there are some holy things and there are some worldly things, and you ought to be able to discern those things. They put no difference. He said, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from the, my Sabbaths. And I am, I am profaned among them. So this next phrase, her princes, her priests, her princes, in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and destroy souls to get dishonest gain. Her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar that means they've clotted up this untempered mortar this mortar that wasn't going to dry and stay saying thus saith the Lord when the Lord hath not spoken in other words there would come prophets in, in, in the day that would say things that God said and God didn't say them that's the lie of the devil that's what the devil told him yea hath God said uh, verse 29 the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. What's going on here? In Ezekiel chapter 22, we have four groups of people. We have the prophets, the priests, the princes, and the people. The prophets were for sale. The priests were for, for sin. The princes, who were the politicians, were for themselves for gain. And the people were forsaken, and they went out into sin. You, know, you, can, you can take the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, and you can blame it all on them. But honestly, they were the sheep of the pasture. And these leaders had led them astray. We have leaders in our nation right now that stand behind pulpits and call themselves prophets and preachers, and they're involved in sin, their lives are not clean, and people are running after them by the hundreds of thousands. May God help us never to believe that kind of lie. I thought about all this, and I thought, how in the world could a preacher be this dishonest? If the NBA, the National Basketball Association, can sell out America like they did last week, and if many politicians could lie like they do, not all, but if many, what makes you think that a preacher wouldn't do the soft shoe on truth? Why would we ever think that? Some of the largest attended churches right now in our city are full of good people and what they want to hear the truth, I think they do. But I want the people of this church to always realize that there is a truth and there is a lie and you should be able to discern between the two. Noah in his day was the only one that did. Let's read the rest of the passage while we're here. God says in verse 30, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land that I should not destroy it. And I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. Let me just say this. You don't fiddle with the truth. And you don't fiddle with the striving of the Spirit of God in your life. Because He's pouring truth in you in your soul number three number one the prince of this world is a liar number two the preacher of the last day would go soft number three the parishioners or the parishioners or whatever you want to say it of the last days will believe a fable 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Not going to put up with it. They're going to walk away. But after their own lust shall they heed themselves teachers, not preachers, but teachers having itching ears, ear tickling preaching. And they shall turn away their ears from the what? Truth. That's what was happening in Noah's day. As in the days of Noah. So shall be the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So they turn away their ears from the truth and they're turned unto fables. Do you understand that in Noah's day, the biggest fairy tale in their day was old man Noah building that ark? What a joke. They'd go by there all the time. They'd pass it along throughout all the other villages and towns and regions. There's some old kook over here building the ark. He said something about rain coming, how God was going to flood the earth. Turn to fables. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I know that my stories that I tell are some of the best parts you like in my sermons, my stories and my jokes and all that. But let's turn it on and turn it off and understand that the truth of the Word of God is the most important part of a sermon. And don't ever forget that. God said in Genesis chapter 3, He says, for that He also is flesh. What did He mean by that? He was saying our generation of Christians are just the same as the generation of people in Noah's day. They're flesh. We're flesh. We have a fleshly nature. We, have a, we all have a magnetic draw on us from the old nature of the flesh. You understand the flesh strives with you and the spirit strives with you. Paul said this. He said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of flesh? When I want to do right, evil is present with me. And vice versa. And Paul understood that tug of war. I talked about this in Sunday school the other day. Here's the striving. One day a, a missionary uh, was, was with a, he'd been working for many years with a group of Indians. And one of the Indian chiefs came in and said, I've got something going on inside of me, struggle going inside of me. And the missionary asked him, said, what's it like? He says, it's like two dogs fighting, one black and one white. And the missionary said, well, who's winning? He said, the one I feed the most. You've heard that story, one I feed the most. You feed the flesh. The flesh is striving with you right now. It's striving with you right now. You feed that fleshly nature. And it will rise up and consume you. But the Spirit of God, if you're born again, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. The Spirit of God strives with you as well. You feed that spirit, man. And that will make you strong in the Lord. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says like this, this, I say then, walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Be led of the Spirit. If we're led of the Spirit, we'll not walk in the flesh, he tells the Galatian people. So, again tonight I'm preaching to the choir when I get on this point, but the congregation, the Christians, the parishioners in the last days are going to believe a fable. You say, preacher, do you think the people of Franklin Road Baptist Church will they ever get to where they believe a fable? A fable is a story that's not truthful. So we could say it like this, a fable is a lie. Now we don't like to think about the fairy tales and some of the fables we used to tell uh, growing up, the stories, but they are just that, stories. Do you understand that a story alone will take you to a devil's hell? And do you understand a story or a fable would lead you in a direction in your life that God doesn't want you to go? I cannot impress upon you enough the importance of believing the truth. Our generation has become, you might say, lazy and lukewarm. Not necessarily the folks in this room. I think you're hard workers. But I want you to take your Bibles look one more place. Turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. I'm finished. These are the last days we're talking about. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. All the way in the back of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. The last day church age is being described as the Laodicean age. Chapter 3, verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So we get to this last stage, and God wants to take our brain all the way back to the first truths that we're told. I know that works. 
but thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Nothing. That would be the attitude of the last days of church. I want to close. There's more I want to say. I'm just going to kind of knock the rest of this stuff out. Maybe you're thinking right now, well, it would be good, sure would have been good if God would have given them a sign in Noah's day. A sign? He did. How about the miracle of the building of the ark? The thing was huge. Everybody passed by, saw it, and those who weren't in the region wrote about it and told other people. How about the miracle of the gathering of the animals by pairs? Have you ever thought about how unique that was as people watched that? How do you get to how do you do that, Noah? Now God's helping me. I'm gonna load them up in the ark. Man won't listen, so the animals will. Then here's one to kind of throw you a curveball. How about the miracle of the life and the death of Methuselah? Say, what's that mean, preacher? Do you understand that as these people lived a long time? Do you understand that Lamech, Noah's dad, had a chance to help him build the ark, his lifespan? But Methuselah's lifespan outlived, out, uh, passed, he, out, he outlived Lamech. So you got a grandfather right there at the time. If you look at the timeline, Methuselah, scholars believe, died the same year that Noah went into the ark. I looked up what his name meant. Now, it depends on who you read after. Somebody's got him like thrower of javelins or something, but if you break down the etymology of his name, and I didn't come up with this, I read others, his name means my death will bring it. Bring it, God. My death will bring it. He was a walking signboard of the judgment of God. I, my, my grandpa... Turner, whenever I was building my house, my dad helped me, but my grandpa Turner was there. And sometimes one thing grandpa could do is sit on the bucket and tell us what to do. But my grandpa helped me build my house years ago in West Virginia. And I'll never forget those days. So if you kind of get this picture, it's like, okay, every day they go to work, and Noah's boys were working on the ark, and Lamech was there for a while, and he finally died. But Methuselah just kind of, he just kind of kept showing up for work every day. And as, and as Noah would preach, the, he was a preacher of righteousness for 120 years. As he would preach, the, God would say that uh, he's going to destroy the world. Uh, believe in God. Come inside this ark I'm building. As he preached that every day, this old man be sitting there on a stool. And they look and say, what, what's your name? My name is, my name is, now they heard Methuselah. But, but we heard Methuselah. But he, he said, my death will bring it. Bring what? Look at the ark. And think of that. Somebody says, well, should have given more signs. What, what more do you need? You may be thinking, well, it would have been good if God had given them a little more time, a little more grace. He did. How about 120 years of opportunities? That's 43,000 sunrises and sunsets. That's 43,000 messages thundered from the lips of that righteous preacher Noah. God has so designed events in this dispensation so man can never say that he wasn't given enough signs he wasn't given enough grace he wasn't given enough time God has been striving with man this is not a prophetical message but I have taught on prophecy the signs of the times are everywhere and God has given us plenty, plenty of grace in this age of grace now here's my question I'm finished how long has God been striving with you? I'm thankful from the day that I got saved and those subsequent months leading up to that. How God worked in a little boy's heart in West Virginia, striving with me, convicting me. Some of you, your children, God's doing that with them right now as they get, they get a little older and they understand. How many thank God that God convicted you and you got saved? How many you thank God for that? That's God striving. In all these years, God's been striving with me. Is God striving with you right now? Or do you even know what that means or do you care about what that means? I believe in this church, 
the type of teaching and preaching and singing, the type of things that we do as a church in evangelism, I think that the majority of the people here, you fully understand what it means for God to strive with you. I want you to thank God for that. And I want you to ask Him to do it more in the days ahead. I don't want you to resist the Spirit of God. I don't want you to quench the Spirit of God. I don't want you to grieve the Spirit of God. You thank God that He's working in your heart. Let's stand together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Don't, Lord, don't ever let us get caught up in the spirit of this world that's rejecting you. The spirit and the conspiracy of a lie. Help us to be in our Bibles. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to always work our way to the truth of the word of God. Lord, there may be some people here that the world's got a hold of them and starting to convince them of some pretty evil things. I watch them fall off the longer we get in life. May that never happen to a person in this room tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We have an invitation tonight. Here's the invitation. How many thank God this evening that God is striving with you? Would you put your hand up? Would you tell God right now? Tell Him right now, I'm listening, God. I'm thankful, Lord, that you're working in my life. There may be a particular resounding issue that God is touching on every day of your life. I would be really concerned about what that is. I would never want God to turn that off. Would you let God speak to your heart tonight? Young people, mom, dad, I think it would be great if we just came to this altar here tonight and thanked him for that. Because the opposite is true in our world today. And there will come a day the rapture will occur. And the way the Holy Spirit works will be completely different. He that now letteth will let until he's taken out of the way. If you're here tonight and you're not saved. I believe the Spirit of God is convicting tonight. Would you not put that off any longer? If you're not sure that heaven's your home, there'll be somebody standing at the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They'll take that Bible tonight and show you how you could be a born-again Christian. Don't delay. Father, bless as we sing, we pray. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. We're singing now. Would you come? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. they play softly here tonight I want you to be aware of the convicting hand of God in your life that's what the message is all about maybe this evening you've been saved not been baptized why don't you come and get that behind you tonight get it settled maybe tonight you want to join our church you come we'll sing another verse let's sing this course together as we're talking about the spirit of God falling fresh talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit right there let's sing it together would you Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Watch this, sing it. Break me, melt me. Hold me, fill me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. The striving of the Spirit of God, we're talking about the convicting, the moving, the wooing of the Spirit of God to get you come in the right direction. Maybe God's calling some of you. Maybe God's working on you and your marriage, how you treat your spouse, how you treat your kids. Would you let God speak to you tonight? Father, thank you for your word, and thank you, Lord, that your spirit is still striving with us. 
We don't have near as many years, Lord, 950 some years, and now we have three score and 10. By reason of strength, maybe 80. Lord, don't let us resist you in this age of grace. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.